Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share Wendigo encounter stories. First story. This story was shared by you slash Lucy Boo underscore 22. The Wendigo that didn't leave me alone. I honestly don't know where to start or if I'm ready to be posting this story of mine. But hopefully it'll help. I know you won't believe me, and honestly I won't even blame you guys. It still doesn't make sense in my own head. I've heard stories about unknown creatures in woods but never thought I'd encounter one myself you know. I posted another story about some creepy old people that I had encountered in the woods but that's nothing. This makes a good horror story for people but it eats me every day. But here we go. I love to go hiking. I go with my three-year-old German Shepherd, and let her go unleashed since we like to go to secluded places. Now I have been hiking all over Utah mountains, and wanted a new hike that wasn't too far from me. I have an app that tells me about hikes near me, if it is a hard hike, reviews and if it's dog friendly. Now I was scrolling through all trail looking for possibly something new but I wasn't too hopeful. But to my delight, there was something new. I don't know why I don't remember the name of it, but I do remember it was at the bottom of the list and it had one review saying, good, I thought that was kind of strange, mostly because people love to review hikes and try to tell the city what they can do to improve the hike and make it more safe, but I figured it wasn't a popular hike. So the next day Kyrie and I packed up our stuff and went up towards the hike. I always carry first aid kit, extra food, a knife and just emergency stuff in case I get lost. It's important to mention now that Kyrie eats a raw diet. Meaning she eats raw meat not cooked, and since we were going so early in the morning I thought I could bring some with us. I put it in her blue backpack I make her wear and decided when it was getting warmer we would stop to eat. Where I live, there's a long drive through the canyon and many roads going towards the hike you'd like to go on. This one was a little further than I'm used to but I didn't care it was new and I was excited so was Kyrie. She cries in the car until we get there. Now I was following the directions on my phone and saw that it had lead me towards a thin road that was hidden. No wonder I haven't heard of this place, it was hidden and far up the mountain. The road only fit one car so the whole time I was so anxious that another car would come down, and how I would handle that but there never was. I never saw another car. When I got to the parking lot, if I could call it that, I noticed there was only space for like three cars. All in a tight space. It was small, so I decided to park my car with the front facing towards the road. I thought maybe it was private property, checked the app but it didn't say anything about private property. I shrugged it off, got Kyrie out, prepared us and saw the trail. Now even though I knew there wasn't anyone parked there, I kept Kyrie on a leash. I didn't know if there were bikers along the trail but after 30 minutes or so I didn't see anyone I decided to let her off leash. It was a steep hike for the first half, but it was beautiful. We were deep in the woods, and I felt at peace. I used to wear headphones when I hiked but didn't anymore so I was enjoying the natural sounds of the forest. It was still early in the morning so I wore a light jacket and decided when it got warmer I'd give Kyrie her breakfast. Now before you start to hate, I know. I know bringing Kairos raw meat was absolutely stupid and ignorant of me. I had never seen a bear or wolf or anything so I got cocky and just thought it was okay. I learned my lesson the bad day, so no need to tell me I was dumb. But honestly I wouldn't blame you if you commented that. Now here is where we begin the bad part of this story. The trail finally stopped being steep and sort of an easy hike from here. When you got to the top, you could see through the trees a beautiful open meadow. On the other side of it, you can hear a river and a waterfall. The trail went around the meadow. The meadow was absolutely beautiful with the mountains in the background, the sound of the water. 
This hike was almost the most beautiful one I had ever been to. When Kyrie and I were sort of in the center of the meadow, she stopped right in front of me and looked towards the meadow. Kyrie always walked ahead of me and when she stopped I stopped since I trusted her judgment. Before I could look, the smell hit me first. You know the typical rotting smell but oh my god. Words cannot explain how bad it stank. It burned my nose, and started to make me tear up. I put my shirt over my nose, feeling nauseous and looked over to where Kyrie was looking. In the middle of the meadow was a deer. Now I've only seen does but never a male deer in person. But his antlers were huge. Have you ever seen Princess Minoke? When he sees the deer spirit walking across the water, and how big his antlers were. Almost like that. The beauty of the deer was amazing but not enough to take away the disgusting smell that was making me sick. The deer was looking towards the mountains and away from me. I thought maybe Kyra's food was going bad, I checked that and it seemed fine. When I looked up again, the deer was looking towards our direction. I noticed that Kyra's hackles went up at that, she started to cry nervously. Now I've heard of Wendigos and Skinwalkers, I am Native American it is common for these creatures to be in our childhood stories. That and also listening to scary stories on YouTube. Now when Kyrie did that, I got a bad feeling in my stomach despite the sickness. It was a Wendigo and I knew that, now I didn't know what to do. These creatures were only a part of my stories to make me go to bed, not to instructions of what to do. Plus my grandmother was the one with the stories and passed away. She was the one with the experience not my mom or anyone else. I glanced at Kyrie again when she cried, and looked back towards the creature. It started to stand on its hind legs. Holy hell it was fucking tall, and it faced my direction. It started to walk towards me, I was going to run until I heard in my head. I am the one of this land. Suddenly it started to run towards me, full speed. I screamed, called Kyrie and started to run. Kyrie was following behind me. I started to cry as I was running since I could hear it catch up to me. It was loud. It was destroying everything it came in contact with to get to me. The adrenaline running through me was making me just focus on running. I didn't know where to go I just ran. The trail suddenly got smaller and bushes with thorns started to appear but I didn't feel them as they cut my arms. As I heard it got closer, it suddenly went to the left as I ran straight. I somehow had the balls to look back to see it was gone, but also Kyrie. Kyrie. I said but right as I called out for her, the trail ended with a foot drop onto a patch of rocks. I hit my head, bleeding a bit. But again I couldn't feel it that much and just got up. I looked towards the forest when I suddenly heard a loud cry from my right. It was Kyrie. Kyrie. I cried out. I stood up, crying and lost at what to do. I looked back to see a river leading up to the waterfall I heard. Suddenly a heavy weight ran into me and we both fell back. I hit my head again on the back and looked up to see Kyrie. Kyrie had blood all over her. It was pouring from her neck. Kyrie. I cried out. She was whimpering, and breathing heavy. She still had her backpack on with some cuts in it. Before I had a chance to help her, a scream came from the forest. I looked back at the waterfall, and somehow had the strength to pick up my 85-pound dog and carry her. I don't know where I was planning to go I was just running to the waterfall as if it was a safe place. I was almost there when I heard the creature land on the rocks that I did early. I tripped at that and looked back to see it looking at me. Its eyes were black or I think so, it could also be that there wasn't anything in there. I don't know. I took off Kyra's backpack and throw it towards the monster, hoping it would take the meat and just leave us alone. 
I was scooting back towards the waterfall, crying as I did so. Holding and dragging Kairi with my left arm. I found that being so close to the creature made me literally weak to my knees. It walked over to me, taking huge steps. It looked so different than before, before it looked like a deer and now as it crawled over to me it looked like, a monster. I don't know how else to describe this awful demon, I don't. I'm sorry. But I felt water hit my head hard as I had reached the waterfall. I kept going until I was up against the wall. There barely enough space where water wasn't hitting Kairi and his faces. Kairi felt limp at this point. I could somewhat see the creature through the water, but still saw it coming towards me. It stood on its hind legs when it was close enough to me, watching me. The smell was so disgusting, I couldn't help but throw up in my mouth. It reached his arms out to grab me, I screamed so loud. I actually lost my voice. After I let out that scream, another scream came from the deep forest. The creature snapped its head almost completely backward, looking towards the scream. The scream sounded like the one this one had let out earlier. I was still holding on to Kairi, crying and screaming since its arm was close. It looked back to me, pulling its arm away and again said in my mind, I am the one of this land. With that, it took steps back watching me and went down the river bank. It crawled on all fours, stopping next to Kairi's backpack. It ripped it apart and pulled out the meat eating it with the plastic bag that it was in. It suddenly screamed and ran towards that direction of the scream from earlier. When I thought it was gone, I stood up shakily and carried Kairi towards the trail again. When I was running, I came across my backpack that I had left earlier and stopped. It was ripped apart so I took off my jacket and wrapped it around Kairi's neck where she was bleeding a lot. After that, I barely remember. All I remember is carrying Kyrie and driving down, screaming the whole way towards the emergency vet. They asked us what happened and I told them it was a bear. They called the ambulance since I had blood all over me and they couldn't tell if it was mine or Kyrus. Kyrie made it through surgery and had to have some stitches on her, along with a pad. It didn't really heal and a huge bump grew on there. It had been infected but eventually got better. She also had a bite mark on the top of her left eye, but that healed much better. They pulled out a 4-inch tooth, I don't have it because I couldn't even look at it but they declared it from a bear. Even though they said it looked weird. While I was waiting for Kyrie, I went to look up the trail on the app, and it was gone. It why or how but it is. I don't remember where it is either. That's all a blur. I have some pictures up of Kyrie. The one with my niece is a hike my mom took her on with my niece. It had been weeks after and my mom thought to try and help her through it. Kyrie looks nervous in the picture but you can see the huge bump on the left side of her neck. There's also a picture with Kyrie and her bandages around her neck. And the one that is the most recent of her neck, it's black. The stitches came out. The last picture is of the top of her head, also black, but it's healed now. I'll have pictures of these but don't know where or how to post these. I haven't been hiking since, and I refuse to let Kyrie go. That time my mom took her she did it while I was at work but regretted it because she said Kyrie was crying and was so scared they had to just go home. My mom knows. I screamed at night from nightmares for a week or two. My mom put white candles in my room to get rid of the bad spirits attracted to my negativity. So yeah here's my story. I've heard stories where people saw a wendigo and they didn't get harmed, and god I wish I went through that. I hate hiking. My therapist thinks I may have some PTSD but only knows of it as a bear. I'm getting through it. Kyrie is too. Hopefully one day I can go back but I don't see that being for a while. Please if you're going to go up to the mountains, please please prepare. 
Mother Nature is not only unpredictable but has things in there that just don't make sense in our heads. So please be safe. I say that with serious sincerity. If there's any other subreddits I can post this to I would love to know, so I can share my story and maybe help others out there. Second story. This story was shared. By you slash North Coast 10. I think I encountered a Wendigo. My wife and I have been running the rat race for years, with a family, a house in the city, two dogs, a cat, the stereotypical American dream. But the city took its toll, the neighborhood got worse, the crime rose, and we found ourselves looking for a way out. Our opportunity came when I was offered a new job out of state. It was a great career move, but we didn't want to move to a new city just to have the same problems again. So we started looking around and found a great mountain community about an hour and a half from the job, and a great ranch-style house with a big back porch, windows everywhere, and a lot of property. The backyard has a big grassy area, and a creek that cuts the property in half, then acres of woods beyond. It's huge. The house is more than twice the size of our house in the city, it's all updated, and has no neighbors within a mile. It's a radical change from the life we lived in the city, but best of all, it was less than half of what we were paying for our old house. The house was a foreclosure and when we asked the listing agent about it, she simply said the old family had abandoned the property. We really didn't think anything of it. The first three months were uneventful, with us settling into our new life, the kids getting used to the new school and new friends, and most of all, us getting used to the big house and property. But then the weather turned cold and things started to get weird on the property. It started with noises from the back property. Things we chalked up to being in the woods, then the motion lights around the house started going off randomly. Once again we just chalked it up to being in the woods. But last night, it all changed. Last night was the most terrifying night of my life. One of the dogs was at the back door whining and scratching. I assumed he needed to go to the bathroom so I grabbed my flashlight and walked out the back door. Instantly something felt off. The dog bolted for the back property, growling and snarling. It was a cold night, about 30 degrees, but the dog plunged straight into the creek and out the other bank, running off into the woods in the back of the property. Flashlight bouncing, I ran after him, calling his name. I got to the creek and made my way across the makeshift bridge trying desperately to follow him. I could hear the dog still growling and barking from somewhere up ahead, and I pushed further away from the safety of the house and deeper into the woods. That's when I heard it. A shriek like I've never heard before in my life. It was a mix of a moaning wail and metal on metal. It echoed through the trees and then froze me in my tracks. My dog bounded its way back to me and cowered down behind me. I turned around and could just make out the warm glow of the house behind me, and the cold dark ahead of me. I swung my flashlight around wildly looking for the source of the noise. And that's when I heard an even more terrifying noise. Out of the cold silence, my wife's voice floated all around me. Babe, the voice called out. I whipped back around and could just barely make out the image of my wife, safely inside our house. The voice called out again. Babe I'm right here, came the voice from deeper into the woods. Then came another voice, just as clear as the other. It was my dad's voice. Come out here, it called. I swung the flashlight around again and this time caught the briefest glint of light bouncing off of eyes. The creature was in my beam of light for barely a second, but it was tall, maybe six feet, and ashen white. It had long spindly fingers that grasped the trunk of a pine tree, and then it was gone. I turned back and ran towards the house. I ran headlong into the icy creek and stumbled. My dog ran past me, making it back to the yard and up to the porch. 
I dug my hands into the freezing, muddy bank and pulled myself out, not stopping to look back. When I reached the porch I scrambled inside. My wife ran over to me, asking what had happened. I just shook my head. I'm not certain myself what happened. I had a growing sense of dread tonight as the sun began to fall. We kept the dogs inside, and I haven't dared to look out the back. But as I sit here typing, one by one, my motion lights in the backyard keep going on. Third story. This story was shared. By you slash dark karma underscore 1994. Central Michigan Camping Horror I have always loved camping. There is something about being out in a tent away from electronics and everyday life that gives me a sort of reminder that I'm not totally dependent on civilization and phones to survive. I know that not bringing my phone is where I made my biggest mistake but hey. It's Michigan. We don't have scary predators here that cause me to worry and I knew these particular woods very well. Never experienced anything bad before so I figured it was as safe of a place to be. It was my younger brother Todd, my sister Amy and her husband Don and me. All of us agreed no phones just tents, beer and a relaxing time away from life. Well I thought it was going to be relaxing, you can choose to believe what you will but this did happen and my life is never going to be the same. We all rode together in my sister's van and parked at the site we used to party at as teenagers. Even camped here a few times but had about five more people with us. Ugh. The spider spot, really? Amy complained. When we first found this spot years before there was an old stump that was littered with wolf spiders. We burned it to the ground after waking up to big nasty spiders all over us after a night of drinking. So we named it the spider spot. Come on that stump's gone, besides it's only a quarter mile walk and my feet have been killing me from work. Todd sighed. We all grabbed our shit and started walking the 10 to 15 minute walk, looking forward to the fire and of course. Beer. The worst part of the walk was the damn broken branches that seemed to jump out just to stab your face and break off. After we finally got there we did the usual setting tents up and grabbed firewood so the rest of the night would be filled with beer, laughter then bed after about 25 creepy nighttime pissing trips. It must have been around 1.30 am when things started getting weird. Hey did you guys hear that? Don asked shushing everyone. We sat quietly and after a few seconds heard the unmistakable sound of laughter. Just some other camper's man, probably doing the same thing we are. I answered with a laugh. Without warning Todd shouted loudly to the people. Got any more beer? We all laughed and shushed him. We were having a blast and didn't think anything of it. Then we heard running. What the hell Todd you pissed them off. Amy started to panic a little. Don't worry Amy, they are probably drunk just wanting to talk. Don comforted her but you could see the worried look on his face as the footsteps got closer. My heart was beating out of my chest thinking we were going to get into a drunken brawl. Got any more beer? It sounded like. A weird recording of Todd only different. What the fuck? All of the hair on my arms stood on end, it really creeped me out. Very funny assholes. Todd shouted. Then more running footsteps, only this time away from our campsite. Must be drunk teenagers messing with us. Amy breathed a sigh of relief. We all kind of nodded and agreed it was time for bed. That was kind of a buzzkill and I think creeped us out a little. Hey I'm sleeping in your tent bud. Todd said kind of with a nervous glance around the darkness. Pussy. I said with a laugh but was secretly happy not to have to rough it out alone. Once we all were in our tents it was very quiet. It was the only time I can remember being kind of scared. I must have dozed off because I woke up to Todd shaking me. 
Dude listen. He whispered quietly. At first there was nothing. Then I heard the most terrifying thing I've ever heard. It sounded right outside my tent like a foot away. I'm sleeping in your tent tonight bud. Again it sounded like Todd only not like him. I was about to shit my pants. Todd looked at me in horror and I must have had the same look on my face because I was petrified. Then we heard the running again and whatever it was it ran off again. Let's hurry get the fuck out of here. Don shouted to my surprise. They must have been listening to whatever it was too. We all jumped out of our tents and ran back to the van as quick as possible. I've never felt more relieved to be out of the woods. This was all last weekend and is 100% true. The worst part is Todd called me and said he's been hearing something outside his house at night. He wants me to come over tonight but I'm honestly afraid too. Fourth story. This story was shared. By you slash cationator. The Weir's Beach Wendigo. Before June 28, 2019 I was an avid urban explorer. I would always look down back roads for abandoned houses and soon to be torn down barns. I'm also a photographer by trade so naturally I brought my camera along with me to capture the experience. So when my grandfather invited me up to his summer lake home in the White Mountains, I was gleeful. Not because of the mountain scenery, or the private lake with multiple jet skis, no no no. I was giddy at the thought of being able to explore one of my most sought after abandoned destinations, Surf Coaster. Surf Coaster was a massive abandoned water park about 2 miles from Weir's Beach. The park covered about 10 square miles and was rumored to be the urban explorer's paradise. I arrived at the nearest public parking lot, a Cumberland Farms, at around 6.40 p.m. I used my GPS to see a topographical satellite view of the large abandoned parking lot of the water park. I was led down a few side streets and back roads until I saw the sign. Hidden among vines and bushes was a blue sign with yellow tinted bulb lights surrounding it that said Surf Coaster. Next to it was a rusted and rather puny two-foot high gate with a faded, no trespassing, sign. I'll pretend I didn't see that. Stepping over the obstacle, I was presented with a parking lot with a few scattered eighties looking hatchbacks and sedans. They were rusted with their windows smashed in, and graffiti plastered all over them. The parking lot stretched about seventy feet in front of me and then stopped to another fence. To my right there was a wooden fence, and to my left down a step hill was an urban explorer's dream. Water slides covered with ivy and moss, pools filled with deflated inflatable toys, and sunning chairs with towels sill on them. As I started down the embankment, I stopped at what must have been the ticketing booth. Inside the ajar door was a small room consisting of a chair with a comb on it, an open cash drawer underneath the counter and a roll of tickets behind the chair. As I stepped inside, I noticed something in the open cash drawer. It was money. Water damaged money. I gently picked up a 50 and held it up to the golden hour sunlight to see the blue security strip running down the bill. It was real. Why in the world would the company leave money at their closed park, I thought to myself. Placing the bill back in the drawer I continued down the hill. The next two hours were fairly standard for urban exploring, chipping paint, dirty water, rotting wood, all except for one small detail. The towels. On most the lounge chairs by the large pool were people's towels. As if they had just left them. I thought nothing of it and ignored it. After I had seen the last enormous moss-covered water slide, I only had one more place to go. The bathrooms. Now at this point in my adventure, the sun had already set, and a cool breeze was making the hairs on my arms stand up. As I traversed the crumbling pool deck to the hillside bathrooms, I noticed something odd, the bathroom doors. 
The doors were rusted steel with large locks on them. When I got there, I was right. Large rusted locks were holding the bathroom doors shut. But why the bathrooms? I wanted to explore them but they were built into the hillside and were mostly underground, so there was only one entrance. As I looked around for a rock or some heavy object to try and dislodge the locks, I realized that the ground surrounding the bathrooms were scattered with bullet shells. They were still shiny, and using my scarce weapon knowledge they looked to be 30 caliber rounds. My stomach turned as the park could actually be closed due to an active shooter or terrorist. Wouldn't that have been on the news? I mean that's a big deal. I settled myself as they could have just as easily been rounds fired by some rednecks who used the water park as their gun range. It was New Hampshire after all. I soon found a rusted fire extinguisher and successfully knocked the men's room lock off. Inside was an assortment of more towels, swim goggles, duffel bags, and dried up sunscreen bottles. The whole room smelled like vinyl for some reason, and I could barely snap a few picks before bolting out of there. Odd that they would lock that up, but it could serve as a home for homeless people or drug dealers. I was just going to skip the women's room assuming it would be more of the same. But then the thought hit me, what if it was something else? What if it was the same? I had to know. After retrieving the fire extinguisher from the bush I threw it into I knocked off the second lock, and opened the heavy door. A blast of air hit me. There were two things wrong with that air. One was the fact that it made me as cold as I had ever been, and that it smelled like a rotting animal. I stepped out of the way to let myself warm up for a few seconds. I saw a good photo opportunity there with both doors open, so I took it. Setting my shutter speed to capture the light just right, I was about to take the photo when through the viewfinder I saw something that made my blood curdle, movement from inside. There was a grayish-brownish movement coming from inside. I dropped my camera and froze in fear. The faint lighting the full moon gave was enough to reveal the creature that slowly emerged in front of me. It was crouched down to fit inside the doorway, so I could only guess it was nine feet tall. Its face was that of a wolf and it had teeth that jutted out of its lips. Its fur was greasy and slimy, like that of a dog's saliva and as started at it it let out the most terrifying sound I have ever heard. Its wail was high-pitched and raspy at the same time. Adrenaline rushed through me as I turned to run back up the cracking stairs to the hill. My feet pounded on the moist soil as I neared the parking lot. I glanced over my shoulder and only then could I see the complete mass of the creature. It had to be at least 10 feet tall and its strides on all fours told me I had to run faster than I had ever run before if I wanted to live. So I did. I ran all the way back to the main road and all the way to the gas station all while listening to its ear-piercing wails grow farther away. I practically dived in my car and nearly stalled it trying to peel out. I drove the two-hour journey back to Lincoln with my foot to the floor most of the ways. Even though I'm back in civilization I still don't feel safe, and I regret going there. I also regret dropping my camera. So if anyone wants a Canon 1DX, check the abandoned bathrooms at Surf Coaster, but beware of the Weir's Beach Wendigo. Fifth Story This story was shared by you slash radical underscore vegan. The Wendigo Story A few years ago, 2012 or 2013 I think since I was still in high school then, I was at a party with some friends and as the night goes on, maybe 11 to 12 at night, one of my friends and I go outside to have a cigarette. The second we get outside there's just this completely awful, foul smell. Like just blood, vomit, piss, and death all at once. Now this was somewhat the middle of nowhere so we just figured it was a dead animal and went on with having that cigarette. Less than a minute later we hear something moving in the dark and sure enough, a deer comes hobbling into the very edge of the porch light. 
So we just mention, ah, how cute, and the like. But then I noticed something, one of its front legs was messed up in some way. And I'm talking like broken in multiple places messed up. So my friend and I are slightly off put by this, less than we should have been since drunk, and finish up our sig and go to head inside. However, right as we start to do that, one of the two porch lights goes pop and goes out. So now it's less light outside and this deer is back into the darkness. So, a bit giddily, we both do this like fake scared squeal at each other and turn around to go inside. And that's when we heard it. That undeniable sound of nails on the concrete patio. We both slowly turn around to see this hunched over, rotten coyote doing this very slow, very unnatural crawl towards us. We go from zero, 600 paralyzed with fear almost instantly until another one of our friends playfully pulls us through the open door telling us to get back to the party. To this day, I have not experienced anything like that and it's one of the most horrifying things I've ever experienced. Sixth story. This story was shared. By you slash Carl B 1961. I got a job working as a cemetery night watchman. I barely survived one night. In the spring of 2003 I graduated high school and had a scholarship lined up at a nearby community college. I decided to get a summer job in order to make some extra money before I started my freshman year that fall. As it happened, a friend of my dad's worked as a caretaker at a local cemetery but was taking a couple months off in order to recuperate from some back surgery he had scheduled soon. Duke, my dad's friend, told me his son Brian, who was about my age, had already volunteered to fill in as the temporary daytime caretaker, but, if I was interested, he had another job I might be interested in. I asked him what it was. He told me. Night Watchman. Apparently there had been several other cemeteries in the area that had been vandalized recently, probably the work of teenagers, and Duke needed someone to guard the cemetery between 8 p.m., when it closed to the public for the day, and 5 a.m., when his son Brian would show up for his job. Duke told me it wasn't an official county position, but he was willing to pay me out of his own pocket to do it. I was a little hesitant at first to accept the job. I'm not someone who spooks very easily, but the thought of being alone in a deserted cemetery at night for nine hours did kind of give me the creeps. But I didn't really have anything else lined up for me that summer, and it sounded like it would beat flipping burgers at McDonald's anyway, so I shrugged and said sure, why not. The cemetery where I would be working was on the outskirts of the town where I lived, out in the country, surrounded by wide open farmland on three sides. The back of the cemetery ended at the edge of a small wooded area. It was pretty big and sprawling, maybe six acres, and was one of the oldest cemeteries in the area, with graves dating back to the early 1800s. I drove out there one bright, warm late afternoon in early June for my first shift, and was greeted by Duke, who was waiting for me near the entrance. He spent the next hour or so giving me a tour of the grounds and explaining what my job duties would consist of. Basically, I would give the whole cemetery a sweep every hour and write down any unusual activity, whatever that was, I encountered. And if I found anyone trespassing I shouldn't confront them, I should call the police instead. He took me into a small shed off to one side near the front. The place was crammed with tools and gardening equipment. There was a small desk with a chair and a notebook on it for me to log my reports and a big flashlight, the long kind that takes 4D batteries to power. As soon as Duke finished showing me around, his face suddenly turned serious. He told me he had something he wanted me to see, and took a ring of keys out of his pocket. I watched, intrigued, as he unlocked a tall metal locker against one wall and opened it. I gasped. Inside stood a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun and a box of shells. Duke held the locker open for a few seconds to show me the shotgun, then closed and relocked it. 
He explained to me that the shotgun was only for extreme emergencies, and that he didn't want me to touch it unless I felt sure that my life was in danger. He went on to say that you never know who might show up at a cemetery after dark. Usually it was harmless stuff bored kids looking for a place to drink and screw around. But cemeteries also tended to be hangout spots for all kinds of weirdos. Satanists, drug addicts, sometimes even grave robbers. Seeing my look of concern, he gave me a reassuring smile and told me it wasn't likely I would run into any of those types of people on the job, but he wanted me to know about the shotgun, just in case. Then he removed the locker key from the keyring and handed it to me. By then late afternoon had given way to early evening and the sun had begun to set. Duke had pretty much shown me and told me everything I needed to know, so we shook hands and then he left to go home. I watched as he got into his pickup truck and drove down the driveway and through the cemetery gate and onto the road, disappearing from sight. I realized suddenly that I was all alone in a deserted cemetery miles from anywhere, and it was starting to get dark. I shuddered in spite of myself. I looked at my watch and saw it was nearly 8 p.m., the start of my first shift. I figured there was maybe an hour of daylight left. I did my first check of the cemetery grounds, beginning at the front, the newer section, and finishing at the rear, the old section. This part of the cemetery was especially creepy. Many of the gravestones were cracked and leaning and eroded by the elements. Several of the plots had a sunken look. Duke had explained to me earlier when giving me the tour that this was caused by the soil settling on top of the old caskets as they deteriorated and collapsed underground. Again, I shuddered at the thought. The back of the cemetery ended at an embankment that sloped down to a shallow creek with the woods beginning on the other side. At the bottom of the embankment was a heap of old, rotting flower bouquets and wreaths from the graves. I figured Duke must dump them there after they began to dry out and fall apart. My whole inspection only took about 15 minutes so I headed back to the maintenance shed to kill some time before the next one. I propped my feet up on the desk and pulled out a paperback Stephen King book I had brought along to help pass the time, this was 2003, remember, long before smartphones came along. I read, absorbed in the harrowing ordeal of the Torrance family in the creepy Overlook Hotel, and before I knew it, nine o'clock had rolled around. I put down my book, picked up my flashlight, and headed outside to patrol the grounds. It was almost fully dark now and I could hear crickets. I strolled through the cemetery, starting again at the front and working my way to the back, causally aiming my flashlight around. I had just reached the rear of the cemetery when something happened. I stopped, listening, suddenly alert. I had heard something. I cocked my head, listening. I could hear a very faint scraping sound. Soft and slow and steady. I couldn't tell where it was coming from. I shined my flashlight around but could see nothing out of the ordinary. Just as abruptly as the sound had begun, it stopped. I shrugged it off, figuring it was probably some animal, a raccoon or a possum or something scratching at the bark of a nearby tree. Finished with my inspection, I returned to the shed and picked up my book. I spent the next half hour or so reading and was just at the part where the little boy Danny encounters the rotting naked old woman in the bathtub when I heard something outside that caused me to jump to my feet, knocking over my chair, startled. Footsteps Slow, labored, shuffling footsteps that sounded like they were moving around just outside the shack. My heart began to race. I stood there, petrified with sudden fear. It was night time and the cemetery was closed. There shouldn't be anyone out there. I remembered what Duke had said about teenage trespassers. I waited, hardly daring to even breathe, my pulse racing, listening. The footsteps seemed to circle around the shack two or three times, then gradually faded off into the distance. Silence resumed. 
I waited there for several minutes, too scared to investigate. I glanced at the locker with the shotgun inside it, but remember Duke telling me not to touch it unless I was in danger. It was probably just some local kids who came to have an underage drinking party, or a teen couple looking for a place to make out. Except the cemetery was five miles out of town and I hadn't heard any cars pull up outside. I stood there for the better part of five minutes, scared and undecisive. Finally I told myself I was being chicken shit and needed to man up. Protecting the cemetery from trespassers was, after all, my job. It was probably some harmless old drunk or a drifter looking for a place to crash for the night. I summoned my courage, picked up the flashlight, then opened the shed door and stepped outside. It was full dark now, and totally pitch black. Thick dark clouds blotted out the moon and stars and the only illumination came from my flashlight. Cautiously I began a sweep of the cemetery. There was no sign of any intruder and nothing looked out of place, but I could somehow still sense that something was wrong. Different. It took a couple minutes for me to place it. It was quiet. Too quiet. Dead quiet. The crickets had stopped chirping. An unnatural hush had fallen over the cemetery like a blanket. The only sound was my breathing. Besides that, it was as silent as, well, as silent as a grave. I felt like I was being watched. I had read that cliched expression in a thousand bad horror stories and never believed it before then, but at that moment, alone in the dark in the middle of the night, in that unnaturally silent cemetery, I did. It seemed like I could sense a dozen sets of predatory eyes boring into me, observing my every move, so strong it was almost a physical sensation. I was scared shitless. I stopped in my tracks abruptly, tensing, cocking my head. I had heard something. What was it? I listened. Faintly, I could that same soft, persistent scraping sound from before. I looked around, trying to pinpoint its location and source. It seemed to be coming from directly ahead of me and to my right. I cautiously moved on, tracking the sound, which seemed to get slightly louder the closer I got. I was in the newer section of the cemetery, the part still in use. I stopped in front of a new grave where the sound seemed to be at its loudest. I trained my flashlight upon the marble headstone. It belonged to an elderly woman who had died only a couple weeks before. The mound of soil in front of the headstone was still brown and bare of grass from her recent burial. I listened, and realized the sound was coming from below the ground. Below the grave. I felt a chill as cold as ice water rise from the pit of my stomach up to my heart. I tried convincing myself it was probably just a gopher or some other subterranean animal burrowing through the earth. Then something happened. I felt a tremor and heard the rumble of falling soil. Earthquake, I thought for a split second, but it only seemed to be coming from the fresh grave before me, nowhere else. Then the rectangle of bare, mounded earth collapsed inward, almost in slow motion, looking like the roof of an elevator car descending its shaft. It happened in no more than five seconds. I stood there, transfixed in shock before a gaping black hole that only seconds before had been a full grave. It took a few moments for my brain to process what I had just witnessed. My mind was freaking out, screaming at me to run, but my body didn't listen. As scared as I was, some part of me was also curious. Some part of me had to see. Seemingly not of their own accord, my feet stepped to the edge of the sunken grave and I shined my flashlight down. The beam centered on a casket lying askew at the bottom of a pit, a pit that was at least fifteen feet deep, much deeper than a grave, more like a mine shaft with drifts of dirt all around it. And as I watched, the casket was moving. Scooting along the bottom of the shaft inch by inch, scraping through the dirt. 
I moved the beam of my flashlight to the other end of the casket, and what I saw is something that still haunts my dreams to this day. There was a gaping black hole, the entrance of a tunnel, in the side of the pit, and a pair of thin, gray arms with unnaturally long fingers and long, black, claw-like fingernails were protruding from this hole, clutching the foot of the casket, dragging it into the tunnel a little at a time. That's when I turned and ran back to the shed, panting in terror. I reached in my pocket for my phone to call the police, but it wasn't there. I must have left it on the desk in the shed. I reached the shed, went through the door, and froze. The inside of the shed was in a shambles. Everything had been trashed. Tools were scattered across the floor, the desk and chair had been turned over, my paperback had been torn to shreds, and my cell phone had been smashed to pieces. Someone had been in the shed while I'd been outside, or something. I stood there, taking in the destruction, then I heard a sound coming from behind me. The same shuffling footsteps I had heard before. I spun around. I seemed to regress in age in a matter of a few seconds, reduced to the surreal, almost wondrous state of terror of a child in the grip of a nightmare. A figure stood in front of the doorway, only a few feet outside the shed. It was cast in shadow, only a silhouette, but I could see it was tall and thin, with unnaturally long, skinny arms that hung down nearly to its feet. Its eyes were red. I could see them glinting in the dark, like embers. They were staring right at me. We stood there for what felt like eternity, regarding each other. Then the shadowy figure took a step towards the door. I darted forward, slammed the door and turned the lock. There was an unnaturally high-pitched, chittering screech from outside, a sound more animal-like than human. The creature began to pound wildly against the shed door. I jumped as something else slammed against the rear wall of the shed. I could hear claws scratching against the wood as if something was trying to burrow through the wall. Something else slammed into the side of the shed. There were more than one of them, and they were all trying to break into the shed at the same time. Trying to break in and get me. That was when I remembered the shotgun. I looked to the metal locker, still upright but now leaning askew against one corner. I frantically searched the pockets of my jeans until I found the key Duke had given me. With shaking hands I unlocked the locker and grabbed the shotgun, hoping it was loaded, I had never touched a gun in my life and had no idea how to load one, and there wasn't enough time anyway. I fumbled with it inexpertly for a few seconds until I figured out how to get the safety off. The banging and screeching was coming from all around me. It sounded like the shed was surrounded on all four sides. I pumped the shotgun like I'd see it done in the movies, then aimed it in my shaking hands at the door, clenched my teeth, and pulled the trigger. The explosion was louder than I ever would have imagined, and the kickback was so powerful it almost knocked me backwards. The next morning I would find an ugly bruise on my right shoulder where the stock of the shotgun had struck me. A ragged hole the size of a fist materialized in the door. For a split second after I fired the shotgun I thought I detected a high-pitched shriek of pain outside the shed door. Then I couldn't hear anything but a ringing in my ears. For a few seconds I feared I had gone deaf from the blast. Then slowly my hearing returned. I knew because I could hear my own ragged breathing. Otherwise, there was silence. The screeching and banging had ceased. I listened intently, my heart pounding, but heard nothing. Then cautiously, still clutching the shotgun, I crept to the battered shed door, unlocked it and threw it open, leveling the shotgun. There was nothing there but blackness. I fled the shed, running in an all-out sprint to my car, leaped in, locked the doors, started the engine and took off, slamming down the gas pedal. I sped down the driveway, my tires shrieking and sending gravel flying. I shot through the gate, then turned onto the highway back to town. 
But just before I drove through the gate, I saw, or thought I saw, one last thing in my rearview mirror. Several pairs of glowing red eyes in the darkness behind my car. My phone had been destroyed, so I drove to the sheriff's office when I reached town and told them I had been attacked by grave robbers, I was scared and badly shaken, but still possessed enough sense to know they wouldn't believe me if I told them what I had really encountered in the cemetery. After I gave my statement they called my parents who came and picked me up since I was still pretty rattled. My mom drove me home in their car while my dad followed behind us in mine. I went straight up to my room after we got back and fell into bed, but it was several hours before I managed to fall asleep. The state police came by the next day to ask me some questions and I told them the same story I had told the sheriff and his deputy, I had been doing my hourly inspection of the grounds and surprised a couple grave robbers who had chased me back to the shed and tried breaking in before I had scared them away with the shotgun Duke had showed me. I hadn't gotten a good look at their faces and couldn't even tell exactly how many there had been. The police didn't seem very satisfied with my answers and looked suspicious, I think they could sense I was holding something back, but they didn't press the matter and left soon after. A couple days later Duke stopped by the house to see how I was doing. I told him I was okay, but after my experience I probably wouldn't be coming back to work. He seemed to understand and was apologetic about what had happened. He paid me $60 in cash for my single disastrous shift as a cemetery watchman. I noticed that something else seemed to be bothering him. He had a troubled frown on his face and seemed disturbed, maybe even a little scared. I asked him how the police investigation at the cemetery was going, there had been a brief story about in on the local TV news, and if they had found any clues, but he just shrugged and said that so far there wasn't much to go on. Somehow I could sense he was lying. His answer seemed evasive and I got the feeling he knew more than he was letting on. He left, and that was the last time I ever spoke to him. It took over a week for me to get over my ordeal but then I was pretty much back to normal. I got a job working part-time at Blockbuster Video, back when that was a thing, for the rest of the summer, and started college that fall. After I graduated in 2007, I got a job in the city, found a decent apartment, married, and had two kids. It's been 18 years since that night, and I had mostly put it behind me and forgotten about it, except for the occasional bad dream. Then, last month, something happened. I had taken my family to the rural town where I grew up to visit my parents for the weekend. Just by chance I ran into Brian, Duke's son, while in town getting some groceries. He recognized me from when we had been kids, we had never really been close friends but had attended the same schools growing up and belonged to some of the same social circles, and invited me to a bar where we reminisced about old times and caught up on each other's lives over a couple beers. His father, Duke had died peacefully in his sleep eight years before and now Brian worked in his dad's position as the cemetery groundskeeper. I asked Brian if the police ever got any leads on whoever it was who had dug up the grave and attacked me that night back in 2003. His mood instantly changed. His face darkened and became guarded. He was silent for some time and seemed to be debating in his head what he should tell me. Finally he leaned in close to me and made me promise I would never tell anyone what he was about to tell me. I promised. Brian explained that the police had inspected the open grave and discovered the tunnel I had seen at the bottom. They had investigated and discovered a whole network of underground tunnels running below the cemetery that looked to have been dug out by hand. Another tunnel entrance had been found partially concealed by undergrowth in the ditch at the bottom of the embankment in the rear of the cemetery. In the center of this subterranean tunnel system had been a large cavern that had been filled with splintered caskets, some dating back over a hundred years, and bones, and body parts, some still relatively fresh. The human remains had all shown signs of having been devoured. I felt a chill pass through my body. 
Brian finished off his beer with a hard swig and set the bottle down with a trembling hand. He went on to explain that after this gruesome discovery, the police had notified the FBI, who had shown up to investigate, and after the FBI came, another government agency had gotten involved. I asked him who but he just shook his head and told me they hadn't said. Only that their jurisdiction had superseded both the state police and the FBI. They had taken over the investigation, shut down the cemetery and had ordered everyone involved, including Duke, to stay silent with the, the threat of prosecution and imprisonment if they breathed a word of it to anyone. The cemetery had been closed for over a year while men in hazmat suits had collected the bodies in plastic bags and loaded them into unmarked black vans. Then one day they were just gone. They left without a word, seemingly overnight, leaving no trace behind. The underground tunnels had been filled in with dirt. After that, things had pretty much gone back to normal. Brian sat there quietly for a while. I thought he was finished, but then he added one final detail. The morning after my night in the cemetery, after the sheriff had looked around but before the state police had arrived to do a more thorough investigation, Brian and his dad had found something outside the shed the sheriff had overlooked. A small puddle of black liquid on the ground, outside the door I had fired the shotgun through. Duke had figured it was probably just spilt motor oil from a bottle in the shed and told Brian to clean it up, but Brian had noticed something his dad hadn't, a thin trail of the same black substance in the grass leading away from the shed, toward the embankment in the back of the cemetery. He had been curious and collected a small sample in a jar when his father wasn't looking and mailed it to an older cousin of his who worked as a technician in the anthropology department of a university across the state. A couple weeks later, Brian's cousin called him. They had analyzed the sample. They were able to determine it was blood, but the DNA sequence wasn't like anything they had ever seen before. They couldn't identify what the blood sample had come from, but whatever it was, it wasn't human. Seventh story. This story was shared. By you slash Mornblade 17. Encounter with a Wendigo-like creature. I had an experience several years ago that still causes me some manner of dread, so I thought I would ask other users if they have ever encountered the same creature, or anything similar. For reference, this was at my parents' old house in the Texas Hill Country, and during the summer. We had a few cats that lived at that house, and one of them was a calico who refused to stay inside most of the time. She would also take long walks with us. There is a creek on that property as well, and while usually we never had any issues while down there, this one time had proven to be quite strange, Topaz the cat was unwilling to cross in her usual spot, and it was eerily quiet. I noticed a little later that she was acting as if something was threatening her, so I looked up and saw it. This thing had long arms, and it was tall, but I don't remember anything like talons or claws. I do remember antlers, and matted fur, but nothing gaunt or skeletal. And very large, dark eyes, oriented forward like a predator's would be. The weirdest thing about the whole situation was just being entirely overcome with fear and dread, literally to the point of vomiting. I threw up and sprinted back up to the house with my cat, and avoided the creek for ages, though weirdly I felt quite certain that whatever that thing was, it couldn't cross running water. And after a month, it felt like it had gone, and it was safe to go over there again alone. Now as far as I know there is no family history on either side for hallucinations, and even if there were, this would have been my only experience with one my entire life, and it's been almost a full decade since this happened. Mostly I am wondering if anything of this description and presence has been encountered before, especially in Texas. It has bothered me for quite a while, so I am quite curious about what others may make of it. Thanks. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end, subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinion slash suggestions in the comment section, and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.